Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Lorraine Hutzler. Thank you for joining us today. Our presentation is Pain Pills and Orthopedic Procedures. So um, we know that drug overdose is the leading cause of death in the U.S. In 2015, 52,404 cases of lethal uh, overdoses, and this is driven by the opioid epidemic, of which 20,000 overdose deaths, deaths were related to heroin. Um, in 2012, 259 million prescriptions were written for opioids. And that's enough to give to every single American person to have in their home. Um, Four out of five new heroin users started misusing uh, prescription painkillers, and 94% of respondents in the survey in 2014 uh, of people who were in treatment for opioid addiction said that they chose heroin because it was a cheaper alternative. So looking at the opioid epidemic by the numbers, on a daily basis, 116 people die from opioids, which is approximately 42,249 a year. Of these, 11.5 million misused prescriptions. There were 2.1 million people who misused the prescription for the first time, and of these, 17,087 deaths occurred. Um, and of those deaths, 15,000 were attributed to heroin usage. And looking at the epidemic, there were three waves. So the first wave was up until 1999 for prescription opioids. Then the second wave in 2010 had rapid increases in heroin deaths. And finally, beginning in 2013, was fentanyl and cocaine. So I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Claudette Lejam. Dr. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Claudette Lejam. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at NYU Langone uh, Health. And I thank you all for coming tonight. And, uh, and we'll have hopefully some more folks coming in uh, once they find the auditorium. I'd uh, like to thank Lorraine Hustler for all her hard work in putting this together, and also Joe Bosco for uh, being a great mentor and really helping us uh, sponsor this, because it's a really important topic. Um, my background is I'm a total joint surgeon and uh, interested in this topic because, uh, number one, it really affects all of us in the whole country, and, and second of all, as a, as a physician, it really affects me and what I have to do next. We have a really awesome group of panelists, and we're going to go in alphabetical order. I'm going to introduce them, and I'm going to remind our panelists to speak into the microphone so that we can actually hear them, uh, and I'm going to have them say just a couple words about them and their backgrounds. So the first panelist we're going to have is Dr. Dennis Cardone. And Dr. Cardone is uh, one of my colleagues and one of my Dr. Radio co-hosts, my favorite one. <laughs> uh, well, clearly you know, my name is uh, Dennis Cardone and uh, I'm in the Department of Orthopedics and I practice sports medicine. And uh, my practice is mostly uh, certainly outpatient based and uh, really based with, with athletes. Uh, part of what I do is I'm the team physician for NYU Athletics, LIU Athletics. Uh, I'm also the chief medical officer for the PSAL. And for those of you who don't know, that's the Public Schools Athletic League, so the New York City high school athletes. And there's over 50,000 of them. So uh, it, keeps me, it keeps me pretty busy and on my toes. And uh, so anyway, happy to be here and uh, look forward to, to hearing what the other panelists have to say. We have uh, Dr. Lee Eagle. Hi, uh, I am a, an associate professor, a clinical associate professor uh, at the NYU Tisch Institute for Global Sport, uh, my er where I cover uh, areas of uh, in decision making and behavior and uh, winding my way there, uh, started out in sports medicine and player development, and then um, went on to work with uh, with, at, with elite athletes, celebrity entertainers, and, uh, and some senior executives uh, on sort of comprehensive care, interdisciplinary care, and um, how it all sort of comes together in addition to some of the work that I do here at NYU Langone in uh, the medical ethics division, uh, is really sort of up and down the chain uh, of sports not only on the performance side, but on the business side and, uh, and how we see it all coming together. Certainly this is one of the areas where as uh, the performance criteria goes up, as the money goes <laughs> up, uh, the interest in getting at substances that uh, arguably and inarguably enhance people's performance uh, and do other things to people's performance uh, certainly goes up as well. So uh, thank you for the honor of being here, and uh, looking forward to talking with you. Uh, we have uh, Joan Kelly, who is our Chief Patient Experience Officer. Thank you so much. Uh, I work with our patients as well as the clinicians to focus on patient satisfaction. We've seen a big change in our pain management scores and whatnot. 
I also um, have worked in this arena with uh, patients quite a bit since I was young. My brother, uh, at three years old, um, ate a bottle of opioids and passed away. So that was in the 60s before you locked things up. So I've followed all of this for years. Um, and, and so it's very interesting to see where we are now and uh, look at the data to see what we can do to even make it better. And Dr. Tony McLaurin is next. Hi, I'm an orthopedic traumatologist and I am mainly at uh, Bellevue Hospital. And so my interaction with opioids is both pre and post-op because my patients are generally not just people who, you know, broke something relatively minor, but people had terrible, terrible injuries, car accidents, got hit by cars, fell out of buildings, that sort of stuff. So they have a lot of things going on. And unfortunately, a lot of them also had a lot of things going on before they got injured, which makes it an interesting population to treat. We have Dr. Christian Payon, who's one of our second year residents, and he's in a special program, and he'll tell you about that. Hello, uh, I'm one of the second year orthopedic surgery residents, like Dr. Lejam said. Uh, I'm on the uh, health policy sport program. This is uh, a track where, in addition to the usual clinical duties that come with being a resident physician and training to be a surgeon, I'm also taking courses at Wagner um, to get more oriented to the, the whole process of public policy and, and speaking to issues like this one. I'm also part of uh, the Speakers Bureau for an organization called Physicians for Criminal Justice Reform. Uh, and, and one of the cruxes of our, of our mission really is the decriminalization of mental health and addictive disorders. And I'm really passionate about trying to line up the magnitude and scope of this problem um, with, with our commitment uh, as physicians and, 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 our, and making sure that what we do is consistent with our ethos when we're treating these patients. We have Dr. Kimberly Sackheim. There she is. There's another microphone. Okay. Um, hello, I am Kimberly. I um, am a physiatrist. I also did a fellowship in pain and palliative care. Um, my father is a pain management specialist, so I've pretty much been around this my whole life. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can give you guys some inf interesting information. We have Dr. Sally Sattel who's visiting us from Washington, D.C. Hi. <clears throat> um, my name is Sally Sattel, and I'm a psychiatrist. And I also uh, work now at the American Enterprise Institute, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., but I'm still an addiction psychiatrist at a methadone clinic. So I think I can share some insights with you about drug treatment and, uh, and other things. I'm very interested, for example, in the nature of addiction itself. Thanks. And we have a, another special guest, Mayor Steve Williams from Huntington, West Virginia. As uh, she said, I'm Steve Williams, the mayor of Huntington, West Virginia. Huntington has um, been uh, noted as the epicenter of the opiate epidemic. We're only a city of about 50,000 people. And I'm saying it before anybody else will say it because when we hear someone describe our city as the epicenter of the opiate epidemic, obviously we take some umbrage uh, with, with that. Um, but what we are becoming noted for is how our community has come together to attack this issue from every standpoint, and we'll speak to it uh, in, in, more, in more detail. Uh, but we consider ourselves, instead of the epicenter of the opiate epidemic, the epicenter of solutions. And um, I'm eager to, to share what we're learning. Thank you for having me. We have not, now Dr. So, Teddy Wilson is one of our chief residents. Yeah, uh, I'm Teddy. Um, I'm one of the chief residents in the orthopedic surgery program. Um, and uh, as residents, I will say I wouldn't consider us experts on the topic of, of opiates and narcotics, but we certainly do sign a lot of prescriptions for opiates and narcotics. <laughs> um, and, and in the trenches a little bit, we, we see quite a bit of issues with that. And so I'm happy to share some of uh, our experiences dealing with, with opiates in our program. 
Okay, so that's our panel. Um, can everyone still hear me? I'm going to walk around a little bit. Um, so I'm going to call everyone by their first name just because I think it's a little bit better for conversation. And please get comfortable. I've got a, a mic on me. So please remember to pass the mic around. And I'm going to ask everybody a couple of just general questions and just a quick answer to, to give us some, some background. And then we're going to get more into something Come on in. We're going to have some, maybe some, some cases that we're going to go into and kind of dig into the problem. And we welcome the audience to participate in this to really talk about these problems and say, what, do you, what would you do? What do you think about this? Um, so I'm going to start actually with Teddy because he's, he's next to me. And I can pick on him because he's one of our residents. Easy so, target. All right, so Teddy, you know, you're a resident. What kind of education did you get about opioids when you were learning uh, how to be a resident? Did you get anything? Did, or is it just kind of fly by the seat of your pants? Yeah, so the education starts in, in med school. Um, and most of the exposure that you get uh, is brief, and, and it's pharmacology, it's basic science. It's learning about the medications and the drugs, but not really the pl practical applications, uh, the practical prescribing techniques and methods that you should be implementing. Um, and so when you, you hit the wards and you start doing clinical rotations, um, unfortunately, you really don't have a very good idea of how you should be practically prescribing these medications. So, so uh, as a pain management physician, uh, Kimberly, do you see that we often don't know how to prescribe these pain medicines uh, and you're ending up cleaning up our messes that, that you're trying to figure that out? Yes. So is this on? Yes. So I actually see a lot of patients coming in on two long-acting medications or three short-acting medications and it's dosed totally inappropriately. Um, people are giving like 240 um, pills, mm -hmm. even though the patient is taking one a day. So they have like a six month supply. Um, but I think, yeah, education is a big issue. So Kristen, would, would you agree you're, you're a second year now, you're a little further behind. Is that changing? I think, I think that here at NYU, it's changing certainly a little bit. Um, you know, we're having this panel. There are a couple of residents here speaking about their experiences. That's that's more than I think the vast majority of, of trainees are getting. And I remember day one coming in here from from my medical school, a medical school that I think was was trying to be conscientious about these issues, but really not having any idea how to treat these patients. Uh, and it's scary because you come in and all of a sudden you're responsible for these people. They're in pain. You want to alleviate their pain. Um, but then you see people that on the other side of the spectrum that ha, that are that are addicted to these medications and and that are suffering and and you're trying to balance your responsibility as a physician and it's not something that you're prepared to do when you start unfortunately. But I do think we're moving in the right direction and, and finally talking about these issues. Yeah, well, I mean, Dennis, you know, you you treat a lot of people in the office. You're not even doing surgery on them. How do you handle pain? What other options are there for for managing pain in your office? Yeah, certainly in the, in the office setting, you're right. I mean, especially in our athletic population, we're, we're rarely using uh, opioids, but it really runs the gamut from everything from uh, physical therapy, uh, acupuncture, uh, other types of pain medications, including over-the-counter and prescription anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, we do uh, injection therapy, bracing, uh, patches as well, like a lidocaine, lidoderm patch, for example, anti-inflammatory topicals. Uh, and we have the pleasure or the unique experience to have athletic trainers work with us, with our athletes. And, and that's a huge, huge bonus for us uh, because they t see these athletes and take care of them on a day-to-day -day basis. So that personal interaction and counseling has become a big push in sports right now, including at the NCAA level, uh, looking at opioids and just depression in athletes and other psycholog psychological issues that they're having. So. Uh, we have the advantage of, of really following them day to day with athletic trainers. So segueing on the athlete question, because you know Lee's sitting right next to you, I might as well pick on him as well. So, so Lee, you treat athletes and look at athletes a very different way. You're on the business end. Uh, you're also a psych psychologist, and you do sports psychology and ethics. So, what does performance have to do with managing pain in in sports and in athletics? How does that those two things go together? Uh, well, it's all really about getting in the game and staying in the game and the pressures that start to dump in uh, when an athlete gets injured. And, um, and you can see it, again, it, you know, at the top level, at the, at the pro level, you know, some of the things that professional athletes go through in terms of pain, uh, just to stay in the game, we would never accept uh, you know, in sort of normal activity. In, in everyday life, uh, but, but we glorify it. So there's sort of the, you know, the good and the tough side of all of that. Uh, but, you know, like broken leg, oh, but you won the Super Bowl. Congratulations. Don't worry about, you know, the, the long-term implications of that. So when you start to think about those things and then start to see that it's really moved down 
the chain into not only into amateur sports, but into youth sports, and that the stakes are so high, uh, you can really I can sort of see on some faces, your, your mind starts to run about where that can all go. And so uh, where, to your question, those two dimensions were much further apart in the past, they're certainly this close, if not even intertwined now. So you said broken legs. I gotta ask Tony a question. So Dr. McLaurin here. Tony, uh, see, everyone's afraid to call Dr. McLaurin by a first name. Tony's my friend, though, so I can call her Tony. <laughs> uh, so, so Tony, Tony treats people with really bad injuries. So you know the athletes, and then you have the other side of that. So comment a little bit about how it's different treating someone who's had a trauma, like who's a broken bones, versus someone who's had a sports injury who wants to get back in the game. So what are the psychological differences? How do you manage those people differently? Right, so the difference is, um, you know, if you're out playing a sport and you always know there's a risk of injury and you're sort of, you know, that's in your head that this is a possibility and, um, and you know, it happens and you you know someone who had it happen before and you know they got back to their sport and they're doing great and they're loving life and, you know, there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. You're in a bad trauma, you're just minding your own business and something terrible happens to you and suddenly now every you know there's something broken in every one of your limbs and you're thinking you know I'm never going to get over this I'm never going to get back to where I was and then you know it starts to wear on you and it starts to you know the people get very depressed and then you can't work and people get destitute and people get divorced and you know there's like the d's of trauma as we call them um, and so these people, you know, really the only sort of thing that they have going for them is that they've got opioids. So, um, it's, it's a big issue. And plus these are people who didn't have anything wrong with them until the trauma hit. And now all of a sudden they're in pain as opposed to say Claudette's patients who had arthritis. So they already hurt and then they have surgery and they actually feel better post-op because they got rid of that deep aching joint pain that they'd been living with, where my pa my patients were fine. And now all of a sudden, everything hurts. So I think it's a completely different mental place that you're in as a trauma patient. And we speak about you know folks that end up at Bellevue, and Tony's very humble. She's the chief of orthopedics at Bellevue Hospital. So she manages not just her own patients, but pretty much everybody's patients and has to manage the whole experience of those patients you not only have an effect on your patient, but on the community that patient uh, comes from. And so Steve can talk a little bit about that in terms of what uh, injuries and then the whole opioid situation does to communities and, and towns and how it spreads out and becomes a problem. Let me start with what you were going to show on a slide where Huntington, West yep. Virginia is. It's right on the Ohio River. You follow the Ohio River from Pittsburgh as it starts to work its way up towards Cincinnati. That's where Huntington is. Um, um, Ohio, Kentucky, and West Virginia all come together at that one point. Huntington isn't in the coal fields, um, but all the coal that is mined or was being mined in southern West Virginia would make its way up to our water port and then be shipped out to, uh, to plants, all of, power plants all across the eastern uh, seaboard. What we're seeing, um, is that in the mining industry, uh, steel industry, that there are injuries of, of such severity um, that when opiates were being prescribed for, for these individuals just so that they could go to work, what we were starting to find is that as businesses would begin to have drug screenings in the coal mining industry, they took opiates off of the panel that was being screened because they knew that it would show opiates just so that individuals would be able to handle their um, handle the pain that, that they were dealing with. And while we have a major problem in Huntington, now we're a regional medical center for southern West Virginia. Once again, eastern Kentucky, southern Ohio, and southern West Virginia, um, the orthopedic surgeons are seeing individuals from all over um, the market. It's about a million person market, um, even though we're only a community of 50,000 and our county is only 100,000. 
you know, so that's got a big impact on your community in terms huge, of like what happens huge. and resources. So, you know, Sally is a, a, both a, a method of maintenance counselor and understands the policy. So what are the policy implications of having a, a, a center like that where, you know, you have to then worry about addiction and, and treatment and you're such a small center? What, what, do you, what do you do about that? What happens? Yeah, you're referring to our, our methadone clinic? Well, not just the, the methadone clinic. clinic. Yeah. Center I'm in. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, like, like with oh. Steve, Steve's where he is, that, you know, he's got to deal with the problem of three states coming to his town, pretty much. And uh, you're, you're a policy expert as well as a methadone main, so you have the both sides of this, this issue, I know. <laughs> I'm supposed to stop. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's incredibly difficult, especially when you realize that now we're in what uh, some people have called the, th the third wave of this problem, which has started, depending on where you live, 2015, 14, maybe 16, you said, in, in Huntington, which is the, the fentanyl. And, um, and that is, um, when you, it's, it's, it's an incredibly uh, difficult problem. As you know, it's 50 to 100 times as, as potent as heroin, it's sometimes being pressed into pills. Now it's finding its way into cocaine, and and to the extent that methamphetamine does come back in this region in Ohio, it certainly has. Um, to the extent that it may be packaged with Ohio, that will turn a stimulant overdose into a fatal stimulant overdose, and it's pretty unusual to die from stimulants. I mean, they they kill you slowly, whereas opioids can kill you quickly. And just to throw in, almost everyone's tox screen has more than one drug in it. So a lot of this is generic poisoning in a sense. But um, so I'll say I'll be pessimistic for a while about this fentanyl because so much of it comes through the, the uh, postal service and small packages. And I know that customs and postal service and, and Congress are working like mad to try to interrupt that. Uh, one potential uh, remedy is to have, um, I know FedEx, I think, and the private and DHL, they have to, they have to tell who, they have to list who their recipients are, but the public, uh, the Postal Service does not. So there, there is, uh, I think, a bill legislation in Congress to require that the Postal Service now, uh, all packages, there has to be an electronic record of who is it's going to. And I think the feds would pay for that cost. It's one of the reasons the public, the service hasn't done it, because it's very expensive. But anyway, you know, if you think about it in terms of supply side versus demand side, there's the illicit suppliers, you know, the heroin from Mexico, and um, build that wall. No kidding. Um, but <laughs> there's that interdiction effort, as always. And then there's the doctor side of the supply. Uh, you know, side of it. And um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that doctors and the AAMC and medical schools and, and uh, um, medical, um, you know, the state medical directors and on and on, uh, even the AMA are getting the idea that um, we really have to be much more conservative about prescribing. Um, I won't take up too much time except to say that one of my big concerns happens to be one of the back um, unintended consequences of uh, an, uh, an appropriate restriction on first prescriptions, maybe not three days, I think that's a little excessive, and you can debate, should the state be telling us what to do, how to do that, but certainly we do have to cut back. Um, what I worry about is chronic patients who have who are, you know, are in high doses, but have been on those high doses for a long time, maybe could have been managed differently at, at the outset of their chronic problem, problem, but are doing well, and now so few doctors are willing to treat them, people are cutting them back. I mean, um, their a colleague of mine is keeping a registry of suicides, so that's, um, that's a significant problem. I need to walk in that office and see that list on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? You know, it's very, it's, it's really quite problematic, and um, CMS, for example, just one more thing, Medicare was going to have a policy where if anyone was on more than 90 morphine milligram equivalents, can you hear okay? It's going off and yeah, on. Yeah, it is. Um, switch, yeah. <laughs> If it was more than 90 morphine milligram equivalents, the pharmacist could put a heart at it and they wouldn't give it to the patient if they decided not to. And also clinicians would have to jump through a million hoops in order to do this. And um, a colleague of mine, uh, Stefan Cortez at, uh, 
Alabama, um, University of Alabama, anyway, a few of us actually talked to the CMS, uh, had a few um, c conference calls, and they actually changed their policy. So some people are listening. So that's encouraging, too. So this is actually a good segue into to Joan here, because Joan is a patient experience officer. So you know, a lot of us have been kind of dancing around this, but this came from somewhere. All of this over-prescribing, or what we say is over-prescribing, came, came from somewhere. Where do you, uh, looking back, saying, where did this come from in the 2000s? How is that different from now? I think one of the areas that it came from definitely is when we started doing our uh, hospital patient satisfaction. One of the domains, one of the questions that was on there is pain management with three questions under that. And what patient satisfaction, what the HCAPs meant is it incentivized hospitals to make the experience better for the specific areas. And if you got high enough scores, then there was a pool of money that you were able to get. It continues today. And they really believe that this was a true driver to make it a fifth vital sign, pain. And everyone wore uh, pins like that said button, pain, no pain, the buttons, <laughs> all of that. And so CMS in 16 said, let's pause it. They paused it, the reimbursement for 17. And the questions changed from how well did the staff do to did the staff talk about your pain? How well did they talk about your pain? It became about talking about the pain and rather than managing it. And so in 2018, in January, those questions changed. And we've seen uh, absolutely in the past four years a shift in our patients' complaints. Um, either they are unhappy that they didn't receive any medication, right? Or we see um, the drug seekers coming into the ED. Yesterday, we had a call that came to the dean's office. We had a patient who did not get medication and said he was going to jump off the George Washington Bridge if they, it wasn't prescribed for him. So we do see this polarity and this big difference. Um, we don't see as many complaints uh, coming through because it's not happening of um, we would get the complaints also that a patient felt that they got too many um, drugs prescribed to them and they wanted to complain about it. Yeah, so that, that's, a, I mean, something that, that everyone forgets that 20 years ago we were sitting around in this room, all of us having the same conversation, but about how important it is, right? The, the, Tony remembers this. I mean, she remembers what, what this was like. You were wearing the big buttons and you yeah, were a bad I've, doctor. And, right. I've been <laughs> in practice for over 20 years, so I've seen all sorts of interesting waves of things happen as far as pain management goes and new medications. And, you know, I remember when uh, OxyContin came out and that was like the lifesaver. This was going to be it. This was going to be, you know, change everything. And it changed everything, but not in the way that everyone expected it to. But I remember I mean, we were, you know, I, the whole pain was the fifth vital sign thing. And I remember there was a lot of pushback from the physicians and the nurses were really honest about, you know, this patient's in pain. You have to give them more pain medication. We're like, they don't need any more. And, uh, you know, and so then it became that then you got to, to the whole patient satisfaction thing, uh, you know, like was just mentioned. And so, again, and I still have partners now who give out, you know, large quantities of narcotics post-op and will say right up front, I do it for the HCAP scores. So... So I know Steve was telling me before the before we got here that uh, that your town is actually in a lawsuit about this situation. So we tell were, us about that. We were the first uh, city in the nation to uh, to sue the Joint Commission on accreditation. Um, very very simply put, what we're when we look back to 1999 to 2000 as to what happened and what has happened since, you can point right to that. Now we're also we're also su suing the, uh, the manufacturers and, and the distributors. My county, just, just shy of 100,000 people over a five-year period, had over 40 million tablets that hit, were distributed in our county. Over 40 million. Uh, there's a little small town of about 500 people that's about uh, 90 miles south of us deep in the coal fields. And there was this one little makeshift pharmacy uh, that uh, had about 30 million tablets in a little town of about 500 people. So what we're saying, before I was mayor, uh, I worked as an investment banker and a, and a stockbroker, and I worked with J.P. Morgan Chase uh, for a while. What I, I know this, is that we knew what was selling 
where it was selling, to whom it was being sold to, the profile of the individuals that were, that were selling it. And uh, the reason that we are stepping in on these lawsuits is uh, something has to, has to change. And frankly, there are those who are seeking um, a, a major financial reward. Frankly, I could give a flip about that. Is that uh, we we have we have to change the dialogue. We have to change uh, the system uh, right now. And everything seems to be to have been rigged in favor of the um, of the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, just because I understand. Listen, I'm, uh, the only the only experience I have with docs is that when I had. In orthopedic in particular, uh, I grew up playing sports. I've had two knee surgeries. I've had broken arms, broken legs, shoulders, and everything. But I played in the in the sixties and seventies. Yes, I'm that old. And <laughs> my dad was a coach. He said, uh, "Suck it up and go." You know, just um, we didn't have we didn't have those things. But what I observe is was being said. Earlier, Marshall University is in our in our town. Um, if you, any Jets fans here, that's where Chad Pennington uh, came from. Um, uh, we see what happens with the orthopedic program and the demand to try to make sure you keep those athletes on on the field. Uh, but I also see what happens to the athletes once they graduate. Is that if they're not a Chad Bennington or a Randy Moss, nobody really remembers them. And I remember when I quit playing, um, I was forgotten. And it was two years after I quit playing where I was blew an ACL and I had to have the surgeries and, and, and everything, but that was on my dime now. It wasn't under, under the, but we didn't have uh, the opiates in the early 80s to, to, to lean upon. And uh, I walk with a little bit of a limp, not because, not because I didn't have a great surgeon. Um, my surgeon, well, the, I went to him to see what was the problem. And what was fascinating to me is he pulled out the screen from 1979 and threw it up. And we had an MRI, and he put that up. And he said, Steve what's the difference? And I, oh, I didn't know what I was looking at. <laughs> I said, Doc, I, d I really don't know what I'm looking at. And he, and he said, uh, it's showing that there's no deterioration in the knee. He said, it means you've got to lose some weight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's and, you know, and, a perfect and, segue and, yeah. into what we're going to talk about next. But, you know, there's a, there are a lot of other things that can cause pain, except for the actual, you know, the real, the real problem. And, you know, uh, Dennis and I were talking a little bit before about the kinds of athletes that tend towards the opiates and the, the kinds of athletes that might not tend towards the opiates. So some interesting uh, information uh, that you shared with me before. So there are certain sports and certain kinds of athletes that are more likely to, to use opiates. Yeah, actually, there's been there's been a lot of studies in literature, as you might imagine, on athletes and who potentially is more susceptible. So some of the sports that you might expect, so when they look at who potentially is abusing opioids, the two, the two th or I'll say the three sports that come up, uh, wrestling, hockey, and weightlifting, weightlifters. So you might expect that we're well, we thinking well, football was going to come up, but those were the three. And the other interesting statistic, also when you look when you look at the literature and look at the evidence, because you always say, well, what about athletes? Are athletes more susceptible or less susceptible for abusing uh, opioids for many reasons, like Lee was talking about, because of the stress that's placed on them, for example, for performance and to get back to play. And the studies have been mixed, but in general, they say that the athletes aren't at any more increased risk compared to non-athletes. And actually, a more recent study even suggested if there was a population, a gender that was more at risk, it's the female athlete even compared more to, to the male athletes. And it, that's pretty interesting. And I'll just say that what's happening now, too, in, in, in sports and taking a lead, there are some states that are now putting out at least guidelines for treating athletes. And the two big things, it's going in and out too, <laughs> but this is that one you, you purposely passed, John. The two, <laughs> the, two, the two big things right now are um, never to use opioids for return to play, 
or for chronic pain in an athlete, which, uh, which really makes sense. And many of the states, like you hear about concussion guidelines and concussion mandates are now doing a lot similar with opioids and, uh, and athletics. So Lou, you were going to say something, or were you just handing the microphone? I was going to hand the microphone. I'm happy to say something. If, okay. uh, no, you know, I think it's really an interesting point because what I was talk, speaking to was really uh, you know, sort of the, the typical mindset and the typical idea that we have of sports and, and opioids. Uh, but it is really interesting to look at it and to really also think that, you know, uh, athletes are human beings and trauma is trauma. So uh, you can look across the room. I imagine that, uh, that everybody in here, almost everybody in here, is a high-performing individual. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be in here. And if you think about some of the mentality that, that would go into your head about getting back to what it is that you want to do or how it is that you would overcome a trauma, especially an acute trauma, uh, you can start to understand some of what goes on uh, in sports and I think also, uh, you know, we get into a whole bunch of things about uh, about mental toughness, and uh, and we can go to a whole bunch of places about it. But really, I think one of the things to look at is that there uh, there are sort of two veins on this. One is the mentality of performance uh, in an individual, and then sort of this mentality uh, that's more human and how we handle, how we manage pain, uh, and that those are two very different things. And Sally had something to say, something to say about that. That's yeah. a bad one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what, Tony? Never call you that outside this room. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, you, what you had said and what you did as well is uh, it goes way beyond uh, sports, even beyond physical trauma from a car crash, and uh, it was, as you said, to just psychic pain generically. And um, and this is, I have a number of soapboxes. So one of them is this idea that there is, you know, so sort of addiction is an equal opportunity kind of phenomenon. Well, it's not. People have vulnerabilities, and they have vulnerabilities that doctors can inquire about. Um, some is straightforward as do you just have a history of abusing alcohol or, um, uh, or drugs, uh, you know, depression, anxiety. And then there are more existential dimensions. And I think that is really where the young people are most susceptible because uh, <clears throat> um, when you have, you know, a teen who probably could weather a, a, a difficult phase, but you know the the events conspire such that either his friends are using it, or maybe he did get a wisdom tooth taken out and the proverbial got the three Percocet, but it was so great. Um, typically, you know, most people use these drugs with no problem at all, and I'm afraid we're scaring the heck out of people about these medications. They're good medications. People don't need that many of them. They shouldn't be afraid. But there is this vulnerable subgroup. Back to the teens. So you can imagine if you're going to have a problem with drugs in your life, they've got to start somewhere. So you might not have the typical historical um, characteristics in a young person. But, you know, that's just the age where they're trying to figure out what's going on, uh, just the age where they might be struggling with sexuality, just the age where if they feel profoundly self-conscious or they're being bullied or all these kinds of things that can make life hell for a, a teen. And these meds are better for psychic pain than they are for physical pain. <laughs> they're very good for both. Well, that's I mean, how they work. But, I mean. um, yeah. So... So that it sounds like folks in this uh, you know group are, are you know very sophisticated about that. But I'm just I, I get so frustrated as an addiction psychiatrist when I read about. Look, I'm not going to argue with the neurochemistry of addiction. Of course, <laughs> of course, the brain is involved. But we've gotten, I think, to over medicalizing this as an issue. Uh, as I said, of course, there's dependence. Of course, there's withdrawal. I work in a methadone clinic, for heaven's sakes. But if that were the only problem, if people just continued to use, if their addiction was perpetuated simply because they couldn't tolerate withdrawal, then why aren't they better after a week of methadone? Because they're not craving, they're not withdrawing. It's because there's so much misery in their life. And they've got a double whammy by the time you've been addicted for a while. First, you have the vulnerabilities that brought you to it, that made these chemicals a appealing to you and served a purpose. And then you've got the secondary layer of all the damage you've done to your life. So, um, But it's much more complicated than that. And I 
get sometimes kind of frustrated with some of my colleagues at NIH for focusing too much on the molecular dimension of this. Steve had something to say to, say to that. Well, what I'm so encouraged is where the discussion of addiction and trying to identify early intervention signals for addiction is making its way into academia. Um, at Marshall University, we have a, a, a medical school, we have a, a, a pharma, pharmacy program, we also have um, physical therapy. Um, recently, within the last year, they started uh, an active program training every student, every healthcare professional, uh, every student in the healthcare professions to identify early signals at, as to the, the presence of addiction or the tendency towards addiction. Um, the secretary of HHS came in to Charleston, which is our state capital, to, to, to meet with us. Kellyanne Conway and others um, were, were there as well. And I was, I was stressing, you have, you, you must start stressing research within academia to be able to, to, to gain control over this. For instance, in that one year period of time, we trained that Marshall University Health Professions trained over 2,000 individuals to be identifying early intervention signals. 2,000 individuals. Now imagine you have 435 congressional districts. Now I'm digging into deep um, public policy now, but 435 congressional districts, every congressional district has medical schools, hospitals and such uh, in them. Huntington, Marshall University is a small institution. But if every, in every one of those congressional districts that gets started of identifying early signals towards addiction to be able to guide you as you're interacting with your patient, immediately, immediately 870,000 individuals within one year, within one year. Over four million healthcare professionals at that clip over a five year, year period. So what we end up seeing is that is what you're doing here I'm on, a, on, a, on a study committee or commission at Stanford, um, the Stanford, let me get it right, SNAP. SNAP, the Stanford Network for Addiction Prevention. And they are seeking to, to identify ways as well. Um, if we have hope, it's because uh, it's being embraced within the profession and within academia. That's, that's, uh, it's encouraging to hear that. And it's, you know, it starts here with our residents. Is that the bad one? <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it starts here with our residents in, in terms of learning. Uh, but it's also something that, you know, just talking about this here, how many people in this room have ever had to take a narcotic for something? Pretty much everybody. How many of you, oh no, I mean, how many of you felt like, oh, I could keep doing this. This is great. Yeah, not, not, so that just speaks to what, what Sally and Lee were talking about. This isn't for everyone. It's, it's, there's certain things that can indicate that, and yep. It's almost more interesting. That's very interesting. It's a pretty small room. Oh, you need to, for the yeah. recording. Um, and a second interesting question is how many people felt they could keep doing it but thought better of it? That's true. Like, well, I don't need this. It yeah, because the, pretty first, good. the <laughs> first question goes to you know, effects on brain chemistry, really. I mean, these all interact with us differently. Um, but then there's that other question, and, um, you know, and that tells you about what people think is at stake and how they weigh risks and benefits of it. Are there 10 things? Kimberly uh, had, had, had said to me as we were, we were preparing for this that there are certain people that she sees that she feels like there are certain people that might be addicted and you have to watch out for them. So what do you see in your practice that you kind of worry about? So I'm going to start with something else that I just wanted to say briefly is that I think that what he was saying, the mayor, um, about education, about addiction and all that 
is important, but I also think it's important to educate people when it is appropriate to prescribe opioids. I think that the new generations of doctors who are coming out of medical school and residency are opioid phobic, and I think that is going to create a disaster as well. Mm -hmm. um, we go from pain as the fifth vital sign to we don't want to give you opioids, so we're going to give you NSAIDs for a year and give you an ulcer, and you're going to bleed and die. <laughs> so it's, you know, that's what's happening now. I would say 50% of my patients have been on NSAIDs for over a year prescribed by their primary care doctor because they don't want to give them something else. And most of them do have histories of ulcers or gastritis, and that is just almost as dangerous as overdosing. It just takes a little longer. Um, so there are people who have real pain who need opioids. Um, now remind me what your question was. Oh, I mean, I was saying, do you, do you have folks that you worry about in your practice? So like Sally Lee were saying right. that there are certain indicators, and like Tony was saying, right. the Ds, the depression, your, 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 your distress, you're, you're not, you're, you're having a problem with your, your, your uh, finances. And now so you there are definitely things this. that we look at to say, is it safe for me to prescribe opioids to this patient? Is it not safe? Or do I need to be more cautious with this patient versus how I would treat another patient? So a history of psychiatric comorbidities, anxiety, depression. Uh, if a patient has had a previous history of hospitalization for a psychiatric issue, that is definitely an alert to me. If they've had a previous suicidal attempt, I it's not doesn't mean I'm not going to give them opioids if they have a herniated disc, but I may give them a weak supply or something that they can't harm themselves if they decided to do something like that. But I'm also going to have that conversation that's very uncomfortable for some people. You know, have you ever tried to hurt yourself? Are you going to hurt yourself with these meds? I have to make sure you're safe for you, and I have to make sure you're safe for me. You know, I always say I've never had a patient, thank God, commit suicide on the meds I've given them, but I think it's because I'm so strict and I don't ever want it to happen. So I say that to my patients so they know how real it is. Um, and other things are, you know, people who have pulmonary issues, people who have breathing issues, you have to make sure they're following with pulmonology, cardiac issues, you know, um, you can harm someone even if they don't want to get harmed, you know, from these medications. Um, people who have a personal history of abuse, drug abuse or alcoholism, like, like they said, it's, they're much more likely to have abuse with opioids or other um, uh, drugs. And people who have a family member who have a drug history are more likely to have that biochemistry that predisposes them to addiction. So, you know, I think that when people are saying to me, I'm scared, I'm going to be addicted, I say to them, have you ever been addicted to, some, want, to something before? Do you take this medication for pain or do you take it because you want to take it, you want to feel high? You know, these kind of things help them to understand, oh, I don't feel any of that stuff. I only take it when I have pain. When I don't have pain, I don't take it. So I say, you know, that that's a very low likelihood that you're going to be addicted to this medication. Um, so it's, a, yeah. it's good so that there are, there are some parameters. So I want to switch gears a little bit here. We're going to start talking about a few other elements so we can have more, like, people we can have a dialogue. And you just grab the microphone when you want to talk, okay? So that's the way we're going to do this. And whoever gets the bad microphone has to pass it on to <laughs> someone. Um, so, so I'm going to just change to something else. So uh, I have and Christian has and, 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 and Tony has all gone on medical missions to Haiti. And we've dealt with trauma patients in Haiti. So what's the difference there? Why, you know, what are we giving those patients and how come they're okay and trauma patients in the U.S. are somehow different? Why is, what's the difference and what have you noticed about that? The difference is expectations because they don't expect to get pain medication so they don't ask for pain medication. I remember seeing a guy who we were going to operate on. He had this terrible, terrible uh, you know, fracture in his femur. And, you know, normally patients here, they're writhing in agony and they won't do it. He is sitting up in the bed, having a conversation with us, mm -hmm. like there's nothing wrong because it's a matter of expectations. And it's interesting. It's not just Haiti. One of my partners is German and he <laughs> is appalled that this 
you know, this crisis even exists. He says, I am going no to yell at you until you have no more yeah, pain. exactly. <laughs> He's like, no one in Germany would dream of going home on narcotics after a surgery. It just doesn't happen. But we've bred that. And I think one of the big issues, and I say this all the time, is that we call these things pain killers. They will not kill all of your pain. They need to be pain reducers. They help you with your pain. They can't kill your pain. And I remember when I was an intern and my chief resident said, would say, you know, people would say, why does my leg hurt so much? And she'd be like, because you broke it. And I always thought that was like the most ridiculous thing to say and very unfeeling and everything. But it's like, I get it now. You can't be pain free if you broke your leg. But if you understand, I will not feel the same as I did before I broke my leg. But every day I'm feeling better. That's put you in a completely different headspace than the, I don't want to have any pain. Joan's got something to say to this. Right. <laughs> and this goes to understand your patients and what the expectations are. And when we look at our HCAP scores, particularly on pain management here, we when we slice it by ethnicity, so the patients will say whether they're Hispanic, they're Asian, and when we slice it that way, we find there's just statistically difference uh, in that, so that our Asian population gives us the lowest scores and in orthopedics for pain management. When we look at the EPIC scores, when they're being rounded on, they actually are the ones who give the lowest pain scores. So when they're being rounded on, they're saying we have no pain. When they go home, they're pretty mad because they, <laughs> they had pain, and this is cultural. Right, So we find our highest um, patient satisfaction scores for pain are from a Hispanic population. And so it's really understanding our patient population and where they're coming from. We use the most integrative health services for our Asian population. And that's where we want to really understand the patient themselves, their needs, as well as their expectations coming in. So uh, uh, Christian and Teddy have to deal with people calling them up and saying, I want more pain medicine. And, and how do you handle that when, you know, you're on that end of the phone call and you're the resident, you don't want to call Tony, especially don't want to call her Tony, you want to call her Dr. McLaurin, um, uh, and, and say, I, you know, your patients, what should I do? So what do you, how do you handle that? Well, that's one of the very unique features of being a resident. And uh, <laughs> to a, for a lot of attendings, they have practices, they have patients they follow, they develop a rapport and a relationship. As a resident, we're put in a situation quite a bit where we're meeting this patient for the first time or answering the phone, we've never met this patient before. And so it's very hard for us to decipher the background of this patient, what vulnerabilities they have, what predispositions they have, and what risk factors they have. Um, but we're faced with a situation where we need to rectify, fix the situation, help the patient um, with their pain. And it's very tempting to solve that problem by giving them pain medication so they don't wake the attending up at night. Um, so the attending doesn't find out in the next office visit that you don't get we the emails or the voice pain medication. <laughs> um, so it's a very challenging dilemma when you're put in that situation as a resident. Um, and it's very hard to navigate. Uh, and you certainly can reach out to our attendings. And our attendings are very receptive. Um, but you don't want to be calling your attending every day at 10 p.m. asking them about that patient. Um, so it's, it's a, I think, a pretty unique challenge as a resident. Um, when you meet these patients once and maybe only once. Well, we have a, a, a new system. Go ahead, Tony. We have a new system here in New York that's been around for a few years, uh, the, the prescription monitoring program, where you know when you write a prescription, you have to check the, the monitoring. So do you folks have to do that now, right? Have you ever had to tell somebody that, sorry, I see you have tons of stuff on here. I can't give it to you. So yeah, look, grab that. Oh, we have, have this this iStop program here, and, and there have been some very uncomfortable situations sometimes with patients where they call into the immediate care center, and at some point they've had care given to them by an orthopedic physician, uh, and they're asking for a refill of their pain medication. And, and you check on iStop, and you see that they already have numerous prescriptions that have been filled within the last few days, and then you're putting this – it's a difficult situation where you have to confront the patient and tell them that you don't feel comfortable prescribing those medications um, and, and using the record to, to sort of explain to them that there are numerous other refills that they've already filled. Um, and I think it's a little bit of a double-edged sword, I think, um, because on one side, you know, you have this information at hand that it sort of justifies your decision not to prescribe the medication to the patient. Um, 
you know, I say, I can't do it. Look, I have evidence here that, that you have many me medications already prescribed to you. I don't feel comfortable giving them to you. Um, well, it's dangerous. I mean, yeah, exactly. And it's dangerous. Right. Um, but I think it also, for orthopedic residents at least, um, has put us in this situation where we're dealing with people that are affected by chronic pain, uh, that have numerous comorbidities, that are clearly, they clearly have an issue, and one that we're not really trained yet to deal with. Um, I don't know that we have the resources at hand always to, to one, confront that patient and tell them that we're not going to be able to give them more pain medication, but two, to tell them where they should go to find help. And I think that's really, that's really something that we need to work on in our undergraduate medical education, our graduate medical education programs. Um, and, and you were speaking about how we could make a tremendous impact by training people um, at these academic medical centers, and I agree with that 100%. This is an issue that is a public health, that is a public health crisis. And we have to treat it as such. As such. And um, I think that as a medical community, especially as a generation of physicians that were minted in this generation of the opioid crisis, we have an opportunity um, to address this problem and, and take accountability for an issue that in some way we've perpetuated as physicians, unfortunately. I just wanted to say a couple of things real quick. Um, the one, the thing with the eye stop that some of the patients don't realize is that because of where we live, you can actually check neighboring states as well. So a lot of times people will be getting all of their medications in New Jersey and they figure, oh, I'm here in New York seeing this doctor. I can, they won't know. We can but flip it past. Yeah, you can actually, <laughs> it's New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut that you can check. So I think that's a big thing. The other thing I just wanted to get back to real quick about the expectations. Um, as I mentioned, one of my partners gives loads of narcotics to people post up. My other partner Ever, for as long as I've known him, so for 15 years, he always told his patients, you will not get narcotics for longer than two weeks post-op. And now he said he's actually started telling them, whatever you get when you leave the hospital, when you run out, that's it. And he said he doesn't get these calls because, again, he set the expectations. So I think that's a huge, huge thing. I'm a little evangelical about this. <laughs> um, you can change the world, beginning right here. And certainly with those who are coming through the program, because um, you're, you're facing the results of, of what has happened. Um, a few years ago, I was on a part of a national opiate task force that was task force of city officials and uh, and county officials the first day that we were meeting the admonition that was being placed to us is that learn from the past mistakes because if we if we don't learn from those we might figure out how to deal with opiates but what's the next addiction that's coming down the road you're robbing peter to pay paul you keep making 15. a new problem because you're trying to fix one problem. exactly and w the one thing that I have learned is that if we're going to effectively and finally be able to address this, everyone, everyone has to take ownership. Everyone has to take ownership. And mayors and other public, public policy makers uh, have a responsibility to make sure that they're driving that in, in their communities. But I'm being evangelical here is that this is something that every one of you have to take personal responsibility in. And as we are doing that, there's an adage that I've learned over the years, when you, when you name it, you can own it. We're naming it right now by addressing this issue very directly. When you name it, you can own it. When you're owning it and know that when you're working with your patients, in your practice and you're owning it then you have the opportunity to be able to start controlling it that's the way that we move our way out of this but that's also where we don't end up doing what has been said that we create other problems i mean this is this is such a complex issue you're you're in the health business <laughs> and trying to help people heal. Not one of you would intentionally uh, do something that would make people worse. But, what, but we have to have front of mind awareness that the way that we go about doing, doing things has created 
the single largest existential health crisis in our nation. This is greater than any level of terrorism that's because it's eating away our foundation from, from the inside. And as was said at the, at the very beginning, 80% of those who are fighting the opiate epidemic started with prescriptions and then led to prescription abuse. And then when the prescriptions weren't around, then the heroin and the fentanyl came rolling. So we're going to try to talk about a case study now. All right, so we're going to, I'm going to make up a pretend patient, and I'm going to actually, Joan, I'm going to make you, you the mom of the patient. Is that okay? Sure. All right, you're the mom of this uh, patient, and she is a high school athlete, and uh, she is very, very good at her, her sport. Why don't we say she's a, a field hockey player, because we're going to say hockey, because Dennis said hockey is one of the, the big ones here. She's a field hockey player, and, and she's a really good field hockey player. She's going to get a scholarship and everything to college. Um, and, uh, and she hurts herself while playing field hockey, but, but the championships are coming up and, and everything, and she hurts herself. And uh, she sees in your medicine cabinet, because you had a tooth pulled a few months ago, a bottle of Vicodins. <coughs> and doesn't tell you, she goes and gets one, takes it, says, oh, I feel better. She plays. And she keeps playing, and then ends up hurting herself even more. You take her to the doctor. You're taking her to the doctor, Jones. So I'm going to tell you what, what do you what do you ask your daughter when she goes to the doctor? What do you tell her? You know, what do you say to her? What, what where's my where's my Vicodin? What happened to my Vicodin? Well, that's <laughs> if you find it. You yeah. find most parents actually don't find it. Yeah. And and depending on how old she is, some of the conversation she may not actually hear everything that the doctor says to her. So most mothers are trying to make sure they're in the room there. And what we see, what we hear, is that. The parents are believing their children because there's been no evidence previous to that that anything happened. They're they're doing well in school. They're a good athlete, and so there's really no evidence that they've done anything wrong. And that's where the first that should be your first trigger, and that's what's being missed. So you're taking her to see Dennis over there. So Dennis, you know, you see this athlete, and what what, what kind of injury should we have her have? What do we ACL want? tear. An ACL tear. She has an ACL tear. So what what happens? What do you do when you first meet this this person? What 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 name should we give this person? Joanne. All right, Joan and Joanne, that's, good. that's a good household. <laughs> and Joe is the dad. <laughs> All right, so, so Joanne. So Joanne has a problem. Joanne has an ACL, and she comes in, and she's an athlete. What do you say? So, so a couple things. Number one is, you know, Joanne, so we'll call Joanne uh, whatever. We could call her 15 years old or 18 years old. And just like well, she's going to go to college soon, so let's make her okay. 17. She's 17. She's graduating. She's got a scholarship coming up. Princeton, I think. Right. So she said, and, and kind of like Lee said, and when you deal with an athletic population, the key here is, you know, her whole world is turned upside down as well. I mean, life, sports are her life right now and, and a relationship with her teammates, her athletes and and where she's going to college. And now there's that's at risk. Right. So now we have someone potentially already going down a bad path with the Vicodin that was left inappropriately in the cabinet. Sorry, mom. But um, and then also. Who's done that? Who's left their bottle in there? I have. Who's left the bottle in the cabinet? Yeah, I mean, you do, you do, you don't think about it. Yeah. Right, so, you know, so the big thing now that we've talked about, and even at the high school level, and especially at the NCAA level now, that's a big part of it, looking at this, looking at their mental stresses and addressing that as well, and not saying, hey, these are athletes, and they're, they're tough, they could suck it up, and, and they don't need the same attention that maybe non-athletes get, because they absolutely do. So you need to really pay close attention to that. And here's also somebody, we're talking about an ACL injury, we won't get into that too much, but this is now nine to 12 months before she'll be able to return back to her sport, right? So that's another big mental stressor for her as well, which is big. And then we could talk you know, about the surgical piece and the younger the age and, and the risk for this continuing you know, habit that she'll develop. But it is really about, a, it, it needs to be a multi-service approach to her, multiple multiple healthcare involvement, not just the orthopedic surgeon. Uh, like we said, we have the liberty oftentimes have an athletic trainer involved, potentially psychology involved. The parents need to be on the same page as well. So it, it really is a team effort. So, uh, so this patient needs surgery. 
Luckily, it's the end of the season. She managed to, to eke through, so she's going to have surgery over the summer, and T Teddy's going to do her surgery here. <laughs> Teddy's, Teddy's her surgeon. So what do you say to her, and what do, you, what, what, do you, what do you do after the surgery, and what do you counsel this patient about rehab and what kind of pain expectations they're going to have? Yeah, so this is a realistic... If we have one that's working. I can, I can just lean in, and you can just use my... Yeah, this, is, this, is a, this is a realistic scenario. Um, and I, I'm doing a, a fellowship in sports medicine, so this is a patient that I'm, I'll, I'll see in a couple of years, uh, and I'll have to make the decision about you know what we do going, what we do going forward. That's why we have attendings. Um, Five-year program. But you know, <laughs> number one, going back to what Dr. McLaurin mentioned before, it, it's about setting expectations um, and, and explaining the anticipated course, starting with how long this is going to take. Uh, the anticipated recovery, what goes into the surgery, um, what to expect immediately after the surgery and going forward as far as rehab, uh, what type of pain to expect and when that pain's going to get better, and ultimately when we expect you will get back to your sport. Um, so how many, how many pills does an ACL need? That's a good question, and there's been some research done on this um, very recently on how much uh, narcotic is used on average after an ACL surgery, for example. Um, Number one, all ACL surgeries aren't created the same. Um, they vary in terms of what graft is used, the type of incision, um, fixation, that kind of thing. Um, so there is some variability there. But in general, most patients really don't need more than about 10 to 15 uh, narcotic tabs after this, this surgery. That doesn't mean that's what we're sending them home on. A lot of surgeons, and there's a tremendous amount of variability, will send these patients home with anywhere from 20 tabs to 80 tabs um, with refills. So um, You can't do refills anymore, though. Correct. Not New York, well, I, yeah. yeah. But continuing on past just that first prescription. Um, so I think it's about telling them what to expect as far as what we're going to give them after surgery. Personally, I think you give them 10 tablets. If they need more, they can call you. They can come back into the office and we can continue it. But that's probably um, what I would start with. Okay. And, in, and interesting, they've looked at this ACL and opioids and who's at most at risk for potential this injury and surgery. And it's the populations that you would expect, one under age 25, and then other risk factors were potentially right, prescribing or if anyone prescribes pre-surgical opioids where they, you get a prescription, okay, here's your prescription, and now after the surgery, use, you know, this is for you after surgery. And they've done the studies and they followed these out. And those are the most likely to start to abuse the opioids, potentially even use a prescription before the surgery. And then also they're the ones who are requesting opioids. And the studies will say three and nine months out, much more likely as well, under age 25 and with a pre-op pre prescription. All right, so we're going to continue this scenario. And now, now that Teddy would have given her 10 pills, but his resident... Gave her 80 pills. All right, so she didn't take them all. She actually did okay. She didn't take them all, but she had a whole bunch of pills left over. Turns out her friend from high school found out she had all these pills. And uh, you know what happens, Sally, when, when people find out people have a whole you bunch of uh, oxycodones in their in their hand that they aren't going to use. You become very popular. So what happens? <laughs> what happens here? Well, Let's talk about this them. friend. People, yeah. Yeah. people sell them, and that is, of course, the 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 overwhelming risk of overprescribing is that it gets diverted, not, again, that the person for whom it's prescribed becomes addicted. I mean, yes, it can happen, but we discussed the, you know, the vulnerabilities to that, the predisposing factors. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, there was um, data from SAMHSA, the HHS agency, um, that uh, asked for people who misuse a word that, a, a phrase that I can't stand, it's a term of art, but it's totally devoid of information. It can be anything from ad addiction to taking an extra Percocet, you know, here and there. But in any case, they questioned a population of misusers, and um, only 20% actually got them from a doctor, or one doctor, I should say, in other words, their own doctor. And, and when um, the mayor mentioned, um, and correctly so, that, uh, you know, 20 percent of, uh, or is it 80 percent of people who are now in, in treatment, in a treatment population on, uh, in there for opioids, presumably heroin, um, started with prescription pills. That is true, but those pills weren't prescribed for them. Not, you said, didn't say they were. I'm just clarifying, because a lot of people do think that means they were given to them by their doctors. Now, uh, that same research group repeated that study and found 
<coughs> that more people are starting directly with heroin. It's about 30% of all people who come in for treatment for heroin started on, on heroin. So but anyway, you get all these pills, and you give them away. You, you can, can make sell them a dollar milligram. Well, in, in, in you sh how much in does it, how much a does dollar, a pill cost? I mean, about I mean, a dollar you know milligram. So, and well, how much does a bag of heroin cost? Um, well, it used to be ten, five to ten. A, five to ten dollars, right? Of a gram. So it's mm -hmm. so basically, you can you can buy one oxycodone, or you can buy a bag of heroin. Well, that's why people are buying heroin. They can't afford the other a stuff. Bag of heroin. I mean, it's, it's um, does not doesn't take a lot. I mean, I'm not that great at math, but I think I could figure that one uh, out. Actually, um. there's a whole what I call the um, oxy economy, which was you know huge <laughs> in you know some of the in Appalachian and and some New England towns. A whole. I mean the book Dreamland. I'm sure everyone's heard of it, or it's like it's you know the biography of this. Uh, of this uh, epidemic, and it's now it's a little dated. It stopped in 2015, but anyway, I mean, people paying their rent with uh, you know these pills, it became it becomes the major form of currency, which like is subway just fascinating. Tokens used to be in New York, you used to be able to pay for a hot dog with a subway token, right? Does anyone remember that? I don't remember. That's, <laughs> a, good, that's a good one. <laughs> but but the but the financial the financial effect is so very real. Fentanyl now goes for a kilo, uh, five thousand dollars. Didn't they just find like a whole bunch of that? Um, mm -hmm. Lorraine sent me an article on it. Yeah. Where was it? Um, In Ohio. Ohio. Um, well, like when five, it, when, five and a half million dollars worth well, of fentanyl found somewhere. It's in the Akron area is where it's really worse mm -hmm. right now. Um, but with five thousand dollars with a kilo. And one uh, gram milligram per tablet, and then you sell the tablets at twenty dollars a pop. That five thousand dollars turns into twenty million dollars. I mean, fr frankly, those folks who are selling this stuff are business people. You know, they're they're. They might have question, questionable ethics and morals, uh, but they're not stupid. <laughs> Five thousand dollars turning into twenty million. Uh, one of the things we say is that there are some people who are addicted to the opiates, and then there's some who are addicted to the money. And that's the big challenge that we're having in as public policymakers. So I wanted to, to bring Lee into this a little bit because uh, you know we were talking a little bit about about sports and taking these medicines but so our athlete you know is, is we're just going to go back to the athlete for a minute she she's she took her vicodin for her or oxycodone for her her pain and she has a random drug test because she's on a elite team what happens with that is that on is that a, is that going to be a problem for her well that depends uh how clever she is in <laughs> getting around the test um so part of this i think is actually uh some of the, the thinking in it is sort of expectations, sort of expect this, and I'll tell you what to do with your expectations. Uh, and it's it's not entirely unique to the U.S., but it is really kind of interesting because um, if you go to Europe, for example, uh, and you look at sports all the way up, uh, as, you go, as an athlete goes up the chain, uh, in, you, a mental skills coach would absolutely be part of the game plan. It's unusual not to hear. It's still sort of the dark arts. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, we're doing something cool. We have that. Not in, not in Europe for sure. And the medical staff is highly regarded and looked at as part of, really as part of the coaching staff and looked to in, a, in almost a completely different way. Here are some of the pressures uh, that exist for physicians, uh, especially when we get into the ethics of it. We like to call it the player team physician triad. Uh, all the pressure gets put on the physician except in Dennis's teams where, uh, you know, they don't, they don't cross you. I know that. <laughs> um, but it's, the pressure is enormous. And so when you start to bring it into here comes the drug test, uh, sure, that's going to show up. And mom is going to do what she can to make sure it doesn't show up in the screen. Player's going to do what she can do, and that, you know, student athlete, what she can do to make sure it doesn't show up in the screen. Uh, Anybody who has a stake in that student athlete going to the next level is going to 
do whatever it takes to make sure that doesn't show up in the screen. And, uh, you know, people get into all sorts of interesting ideas about uh, what they can and can't do. And as the mayor just said, uh, there are people who, you know, are immoral and unethical, but they sure are smart. Yeah. Were you going to say something, Kimberly, or you're just holding that microphone? Well, I just wanted to say that, um, and this is off topic now because, but anyway, um, each different pain medication has a different street value so that we know that some are are easier to abuse and that uh, one way to help avoid this is to prescribe medications that are less worth less money or less abused. And they can abuse it by overtaking the medication, but they can also crush it and snort it or melt it and inject it. And some medications are more difficult to melt or crush. So in some way, even though we're still prescribing an opioid, sometimes it's better to prescribe either an abuse deterrent opioid or like Percocet that is oxycodone plus Tylenol is harder to manipulate than just oxycodone separately. So if a patient is coming in and saying, I want only Dilaudid or I want just oxycodone without the Tylenol, that sometimes is also a warning sign that what's going on here? Why do you not want this Tylenol? Yeah, just pick up on uh, something that sort of making the rounds here is, uh, you know, there's a, a case out this morning um, from Rice University. I don't know if anybody saw, but they, uh, they had a student athlete who died and um, everybody's scratching their heads about it. And it's synthetic opioids. Uh, so sort of kicking that into, into the screen, you know, I'm uh, yeah. sure everybody in here is familiar with all the different ideas that people come up with. It was, you know, it was given to me, it was slipped into my food, mm -hmm. it was slipped into my <laughs> supplement, it was slipped into, you know, whatever it is, uh, that it is now we've got this, this other layer and there isn't enough information yet since, uh, you know, since autopsy just came out. But I read that this morning and, and thought not only timely, but oh my goodness, um, we're not even near tackling the real stuff, and now we're on to synthetic. Well, you have like the, the question of the deceptive patient is, is always a, a question, and, and we've recently had a, a problem you know, with a deceptive patient here at this place. He didn't inform his surgeon that he was on methadone and, uh, and had a, a big problem post-op. So, so, so Tony, you, you see this, uh, this patient, uh, I'm gonna make a new patient up, who comes to you, yeah, and, 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 you feel and you feel they're somewhat, <laughs> somewhat deceptive. Uh, you think there's something wrong. You say, this is not quite working out. What can you do? How, how can you figure out who do you turn to for this? Right. So, I mean, in, in that case, if they're requesting something of you, that's really an instance where I stop is very helpful because <laughs> I stop working is the microphone. <laughs> yeah, this is I stop. <laughs> but that's an instance where it's very helpful because you can look them up. And also, um, what you guys aren't aware of that you will discover is that you also get letters about this from the state. If you have a patient whose name is showing up in a lot of places, you'll get a letter about it from the state. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's an, an easy way to check if they're coming to you for narcotics. But the, the problem is, like you said, the, this person who claims that they're not on anything or just doesn't admit to being on anything and that's a huge problem. And sometimes you don't realize it until you take them to the operating room. And like with what I do, it's not elective. So it's not like people are making a choice to do it. They get injured, they come in, they need something done. And then they get under anesthesia. And the anesthesiologist is like, whoa, this guy's taking a lot of drugs. And so they can tell sometimes, you know, what is underlying with this person. But, you know, that's a terrible time to find out is when they're under anesthesia. Um, and I think sometimes you just really have to kind of give the patients tough love and say to them, you know, this isn't really adding up and I don't think you're telling me everything that's going on. And, you know, is there anything more you'd like to discuss? <laughs> so, so Sally, I want to ask you, because I, I know that we learned this after this uh, patient, methadone is not on the state registries as far as we know. Uh, is that true where you are? Because it's not on the New York state registry. Okay. I'm not quite sure what you mean by registry, but the eye stop. When you search for someone, oh. you don't see methadone. It's oh. not. It's federally uh, administered, so it's not a state prescription. We don't see that on there, and that's one of the things that you know, policy-wise, uh, hoping that we'll, mm. we'll we'll see change. Is, is that true? Do you not see methadone, Kimberly? I don't see a lot of methadone patients, so I don't. Well, there's two yeah. different yeah. kinds of methadone. Yeah. There's the 
the kind that's given in a clinic and, yeah. and that would not show up. Yeah. But then it is still prescribed think, for, you know, pain. Does it, I, yeah. does it show up for pain? I think it might. I, it should. If it's prescribed it's, for it's pain like management. Diluted. Yes. But it's so. also very different because what she does is usually once a day. Mm-hmm. And what I do would be two or three times a day. So you can also ask a patient like how many, t- I mean, I'm not an addiction because specialist. Because it doesn't so. show up on the, on the state registry. The but I stop, when you search, you won't see methadone. From a methadone clinic, clinic, it would not. Yeah, you but I'm surprised it. that it but wouldn't show up. But for pain, I think it might. Doc. Well, if it's prescribed outside of a methadone right. clinic, it right. would. But if it it's should. prescribed in a le- meth, yeah, it will not show up. If right. It's- Just the one other thing I wanted to say again, because what I do is different. There, I've never seen a methadone patient that we didn't know was a methadone patient because they tell you right away (laughs) well yeah because my patients have pain because they hurt themselves they have a fracture there's something wrong with them and you're not whatever you're giving them because you're giving them the normal dose of pain medication and it is not touching them and they're not getting their methadone either so I mean they will tell you on rounds you go see that person in the morning and that person is screaming and yelling and they know exactly what they get and they tell you what they get. And those are the ones in a treatment program, not the ones who are, you know, using it on their own or whatever. Um, but it's, so I, just by the nature of what I do, <laughs> by the nature of what I do, um, my patients make it pretty plain to me that they're on methadone. So what's the way forward here? What, what's, if we had a magic wand, we're going to just go one or the other to wrap up because we're going to leave a little time for some questions. What would you, Kimberly, what would be your magic wand? How can we fix this problem? I think the most important thing is to have physician education about all the different opioids, how to properly, when to pick an immediate release, when to pick a long acting, um, uh, comorbidities, et cetera. Um, you don't have to be a pain management physician to get a urine toxicology. So, uh, I mean, I probably, I don't know if you guys routinely do it as a tr- in the trauma units, but I'm, I'm sure you do. Um, so that gives you a lot of information. Um, and I think each patient should be treated differently. And not every patient needs Percocet. And not ed- every patient needs hydrocodone. And everyone needs something different. And I feel like if the physicians are treating each patient individually, and not everyone's on oxycodone 30 milligrams, 180 mm-hmm. tablets a month, then that means you're doing the right thing. Um, because everyone needs something different. Yeah, I too would certainly say it's an education program, but like we do with many things in sports, we aim the education more at the athlete, the family, the coaches, um, and it's it's much more, um, you, you know, the, and I'll start with even in, in Little League and with youth athletes, you know, a big thing right now is volunteer coaches are wonderful, they're great, right, we need them out there. But it's such an opportunity to have some type of certification or education program, even beginning very young with these coaches on multiple levels, where we could really make a difference for our athletes very young and with the family. And certainly at the NCAA level, it's already started again with we have education programs in place and with our high school athletes. So we're, uh, you know, again, much more out in the community. And I think that that can really make a difference just educating about signs, prevention, uh, and risks. So education in the community. Uh, to build on that, I think there are really two things within that realm that, uh, that really seem like they're sports related, but they really extend out. And um, one of them is really creating systems where uh, there's some independent decision making because that pressure, once you're a, phys- you're a professional in the system, the pressure is really enormous in that moment to make that call. I think you know everybody down the line has really spoken to that. So there has to be some mechanism in place to almost pull yourself out for a moment and really think about that. And, and the other piece that's connected to it is we don't have mechanisms in place uh, as much as there's good intention to think for the long term. Uh, really, everything's oriented toward just the short term. It's a human quirk. And, um, and really, we've got to build that kind of mechanism in there as well to sort of balance the short term and long term. And we all sort of nod our heads and sit in a room mm-hmm. and go, we all know that. But to do it in the moment, in the thick of things, uh, is, is enormously difficult. I agree with the education, but the patient education. And we know that never works uh, by itself. It can't be in isolation. It's helping shift a culture. So we need additional services. So the integrative health, and what we're seeing success now is in the virtual reality. 
um, even with uh, in rehab here and, and other things. So how do we bring in other things that are used in different cultures who don't really have these problems and input them here? Yeah, I agree with all that. Just to build on it, I would say, since you started out thinking I had something to say about policy, um, you know, so much of this, what I think is near hysteria now and a, a great climate of, of hypervigilance bordering on paranoia about prescribing that we are going to end up with a lot of bleeding ulcers and the kinds of things that Kimberly mentioned because now there's such a aversion to prescribing that much of this can be traced to the 2016 CDC guidelines, which are actually fine. They're reasonable, but they have gotten... They're, they're, uh, they're, they've gotten totally distorted. Um, they were guidelines. They said they were guidelines. They're not mandates. They're not directives. They're not requirements, but they were taken that way. And I, um, I really wish that the CDC would uh, take much more responsibility for this. It's not their fault it was misinterpreted, but now that it is, they should be much more aggressive about correcting the record. Um, you know, have a huge press conference with the president of the AMA on one side and the DEA on the other because so many docs, maybe not here, but, you know, private docs are terrified that the DEA is going to come kicking down their door. And um, again, clarify, clarify, clarify. This isn't what we meant. Your patient's doing well on these medications. Offer them the chance to come off, but, but you know, mandatory forced withdrawal of a patient who's been responsible and functional to me is unethical. Well, it's not one size fits all. I think we've heard that all around here. You know, treat, you know, treat the patient individually. And I know Steve has a lot to say about this in the community. Just keep this in, in mind. Wherever you end up, you're going to be facing this. It could be right here in the largest city in the nation, but it could also be in the most rural areas of our, of our country. Um, a year ago, I was uh, down in Miami at the U.S. Conference of Mayors and uh, um, met with met with your mayor for an hour and a half talking about what we're doing here, um, how we were addressing it in Huntington, and how he's addressing it uh, right here in in the city. The, the the key the key is this: is that um, from your standpoint. Um, as I said earlier, you have to take ownership of this. Prevention has to be a, a, a principal part of whatever we're, we're doing. Prevention, intervention, treatment, and absolutely law enforcement. But the prevention plays a, such, a, such a major role. But the fact of what you're going through here, no, no matter where you're going to go, you're going to be facing this. As, as I said to Mayor de Blasio, so whether you're in a town of 500 people, 5,000, 50,000, 500,000, or 5 million plus, we're all dealing with the same stuff. We're dealing with the same stuff. And, and the only thing that's different are the zeros. We're having to deal with the same stuff. I mean, here I am coming in mm -hmm. to New York City, mayor of a small 50,000 population town, dealing with these real issues. You're going to be facing them no matter where you go. So I think it's a matter of, it's a two-pronged thing. One is, uh, as I talked about before, changing expectations. I mean, we went from when I was in medical school, someone had their ACL done, they were in the hospital, inpatient for a week. And now getting an ACL is an outpatient surgery. A lot of the fracture surgeries that I do are now outpatient. And no one questions it because we changed the expectation joint replacements. You know, there was two weeks in the hospital. Now they, some of them go home the same day. So I think if we, ch we were able to change expectations in that respect, we can also change patient expectations in terms of what they're going, you know, what to expect from pain, what they're going to get, what they should expect in terms of medication. And the other thing is on us to be more proactive. And I know, again, in the joint world, they're doing this more. And in sports, 
you can actually preemptively give people medication. It's been shown that if you give them uh, not even narcotic medications, but anti-inflammatories or Tylenol preoperatively, that they actually have lower uh, lower opioid needs postoperatively. So I think we as physicians need to better educate ourselves on the different options that are out there to avoid narcotics. I mean, all I, I you know I write two prescriptions. I write narcotics and I write antibiotics. I don't know how to write anything else. Mm-hmm. So or and, and anti-inflammatory. So I guess three. So maybe I need to learn something else. Um, what, I th- what I think we need to do moving forward is absolutely integrate physician education. That's going to be a big part of this. We have to train the next generation of, of, um, of doctors and healers to deal with this problem. Um, and, I, and I also want to say that I think that if, if we're going to move forward um, and solve this issue, we can't forget about our vulnerable populations. Um, Dr. McLaurin actually is very unique in that she also treats a prison population at Bellevue Hospital. Um, and, and this is a problem that's affecting people from every social strata and and, uh, and we have to move forward with the reforms that we make with an ethic of compassion, of non-maleficence, and solidarity. Because we're all in this together. And it doesn't matter if you're from the lowest rung of society or a CEO at a company, you're vulnerable to this problem. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the reforms that we implement address those ethical principles as such. Okay. Yeah, so just to echo a, a little bit of what the other panelists said, um, I think it starts, the groundwork starts in awareness which is kind of what we're doing here today, uh, education, um, which ultimately leads to better expectations. Uh, but I also, and I, this is almost posing a question, I, I wonder what the role is uh, moving forward for some practical groundwork for how we're going to solve this. Um, so looking at our de- department, um, and this came up today during our conference, but rolling out more standardized, evidence-based solutions um, to how we approach these patients, how we evaluate them, um, how we get them ready for interventions that we do, and then ultimately how we treat their pain postoperatively. Um, because there's a tremendous amount of variability not based in any kind of science or evidence out there. Um, and maybe one approach, and these patients need to be treated uh, uh, uniquely, because no two patients are the same. But uh, I wonder if there is a role, especially in an institution like this, for uh, more standardized approaches, at least as a start. Well, I, I want to I want to thank our panelists for for a wonderful conversation. So give them a hand here. And uh, you know another another thing is am I coming through okay? Another thing that uh, that we haven't touched on, we just haven't had time. This has flown by so fast. Is you know how do you treat the people who are addicted now? You know, and that's really important. And I think everyone here agrees that you know you can't just ignore the folks that are already stuck. Uh, and we need resources in small towns, and we need them in big cities to try to address those who are addicted and help them overcome that and, and transition to something else where it's not uh, a big stigma on them. Uh, it, they're not they're not criminals because they have a, a, a medical problem. And I think uh, you know Christian is very interested in this whole decriminalization, and that may actually solve some of the money problem too. So if we are able to create a, a society where we have understanding that certain people need certain things and we can give it to them uh, without them feeling like criminals and without them feeling the need to deceive us, uh, perhaps we may be able to get a little further on this as well. Thank you very much.